Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 6, to verses 1 through 4. Did I turn it? There we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And here we're looking at this picture of discipline and the way that we raise our children and discipline our children. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Very familiar passage of Scripture. We read, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And here, as we look at this passage of Scripture, what I want to lift from this text is three three phases that I see in this discipleship and discipline process with our children. Three phases, I believe, that are outlined clearly here in this passage. And they are these. The first phase is the discipline and training phase. The second phase, what I like to call the catechism phase. And the third phase, the discipleship phase. Now, again, these are not hard and fast uh Phases here, uh, they don't necessarily begin and end at particular times, uh, nor do they open and close uh, consecutively. Uh, these are things that we're doing all the time with our children. Uh, but, for example, the discipline and training phase is incredibly important, crucial in those first few years of a child's life, especially those first few years of a child's life. Are we done with discipline and training after those first two or three years? Uh, no, we're not. But it's most crucial and matters more than all else during those first three years. Uh, The catechism phase. That catechism phase generally begins when children become verbal. Um, That changes from child to child. It changes between, it's different from boys to girls. Uh, But it's generally when children become verbal. And that discipleship phase is the one that begins uh, later on in their lives, becomes a little more clear cut, but I'll I'll get to that momentarily. Um, As we talk about this, the idea of the discipline of our children and the training of our children with you, you you often get confusion and sometimes you actually get um objections within reform circles because it is as though some who perhaps don't understand the doctrines of grace um as thoroughly some perhaps who haven't been around Reformed doctrine very long, um, get, start to lean on and understand the sovereignty of God. And it's just, it's, it's blessed, this idea of the sovereignty of God. But as you well know, there are some people who embrace the idea of the sovereignty of God and then stop engaging in evangelism. Or if they don't stop engaging in evangelism, they feel funny about it. As though somehow, witnessing with passion is evidence that they don't really believe in the sovereignty of God. Some will apply that same thing to the way that we discipline and disciple our children. And it's as though, wait a minute, you believe in the sovereignty of God, but it sounds like you're saying here that if we just do this, everything will turn out all right with our kids. I'm not saying that at all. This is not formulaic, and there are no guarantees. Listen to this from Lorraine Bettner, as he talks about this kind of objection. This objection, however, like the one, the effect that this system discourages all motives to exertion, is completely answered by the great principle which we hold and teach, namely, that the means as well as the ends are foreordained. God's decree that the earth should be fruitful did not exclude but included the sunlight, the showers, the tillage of the husbandman, etc. If God has foreordained a man to have a crop of corn... He has also foreordained him to plow and plant and cultivate and to do all other necessary things to secure the crop. Just as the purpose to build includes the hewing of stone, the squaring of timbers, and the preparation of all materials which enter into the structure, and as a declaration of war includes arms, ammunition, ships, and all other necessary equipment. Again, Because we prepare and do those things that are necessary, does it mean that we don't trust in the sovereignty of God? 
Does the farmer who trusts in the sovereignty of God stop planting, weeding, fertilizing? No. He does all those things because the God who we serve has foreordained the ends as well as the means. Do I believe that God is sovereign in salvation? Absolutely. But I believe that he uses the foolishness of preaching to call out those who are his. And so I preach. Thank God for the doctrine of election. And in the words of Spurgeon, let's go elect some more. Amen. Not that you're going to add to the number that God elects, but the idea there is that we're passionate about those whom God has called to be his own, hearing the gospel, which is the means by which he calls them to himself. So we proclaim the gospel. And there are those who argue, you know, it's interesting, you believe in the sovereignty of God thing. seems like it would sort of eliminate your motivation to evangelism. Quite the contrary. It guarantees my success. Amen. Amen. It guarantees my success and motivates me all the more. God uses the foolishness of preaching. The same when it comes to our children. This is not about guaranteed outcomes, but this is about us obeying God and trusting Him to bring forth fruit as He's promised He would. So, in this first phase, the discipline and training phase, what are we saying to our children? We are saying, child, give me your attention. That's it. Those first few years of life, nothing is more important to say to our children than, give me your attention. Human babies are different than the other babies in the animal kingdom. Babies in the animal kingdom come into this world, they plop down on the ground, and within minutes, they're up walking around. Within minutes, human babies not so much. Can't make it on their own. They are utterly dependent. God has designed them that way. Because of that, when a human baby comes home, we spend, we pay much more attention to that baby than that baby does to us. But at some point, that must change. And we must communicate to that child as lovingly as we possibly can. You're going to make it now. Your survival has been secured. And from this point on, you must pay a lot more attention to us than we do to you. Because now that's what your survival depends on. Amen? Amen? If we don't do that, we raise egocentric, narcissistic, spoiled beasts. And that is not what we're after here. Listen to this. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew. Because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. That's just one of those passages, isn't it? That's just one that you just read, and it just pours over you. Listen to this. John Wesley commenting on this. He contented himself with a cold reproof and did not punish and effectually restrain them. They who can and do not restrain others from sin make themselves partakers of the guilt. Those in authority will have a great deal to answer for if the sword they bear be not a terror to evildoers. Alexander McLaren, commenting on the same passage. We may learn from Eli how cruel parental laxity is and how fatal mischief may be done by neglect of the plain duty of restraining children. He who tolerates evil, which it is his province to suppress, is an accomplice and the blood of the doers is red on his hands. Matthew Henry, commenting on the same passage, those who do not restrain the sins of others when it is in their power to do it make themselves partakers of the guilt and will be charged as joining in it. Now we hear that, and when we hear that about parents, and I, I, I just read those, I, I wanted to read those, I wanted you to hear those comments, because here's our natural tendency in this day and age and in this culture. Our natural tendency in this day and age and in this culture is, well, I mean, you know, come on. They're kids and they have their own minds and they're going to do their own things. And certainly, 
we're not held accountable for that. Certainly we're not. Here's what's interesting. If I take those same comments and apply them to a police officer, have no problem with it. For example, there's a woman outside, and someone is taking her purse, ripping her purse from her arm as she screams for help. We all rush to the window to see a man punching and kicking this woman as he finally rips the purse from her arm. And then we look up and realize that there is a police officer not 50 feet away who watched the whole thing. Our immediate response is, you had the gun, you had the badge, you had the charge, and you did nothing. You're wrong. That's what God's saying to Eli. You had the charge, and you did nothing. Does this mean that we can halt the sin of our children? Absolutely not. No more than a police officer can change the intent of the heart of a burglar. However, he does his job and restrains what he sees when he has occasion to do it. That's the call of a parent. To restrain what we see when we have occasion to do it. The police officer is absolutely wrong if he just sort of wipes his hands and looks and says, Huh, crooks. We're just as guilty when we wipe our hands and say, Ah, toddlers. Ah, teenagers. Listen to this from Jonathan Edwards. And remember, Edwards is writing this in the mid-1700s, the early to mid-1700s. Just keep that in mind. If you say you cannot restrain your children, this is no excuse. For it is a sign that you have brought up your children without government, that your children regard not your authority. When parents lose their government over their children, their reproofs and counsels signify but little. How many parents are there who are exceedingly faulty on this account? How few are there who are thorough in maintaining order and government in their families? How is family government in a great measure vanished? And how many are as likely to bring a curse upon their families as Eli? This is one principal ground of the corruptions which prevail in the land. This is the fountain of so much debauchery and of such corrupt practices among young people. You thought it just got bad since the 50s. Family government is in a great measure extinct. By neglect in this particular, parents bring the guilt of their children's sins upon their own souls, and the blood of their children will be required at their hands. Again, is it my fault that my child did this? No. But do not God's words to Ezekiel ring in your ears. His warning. If I say to the sinner, and you don't say to the sinner, you're guilty. Not for what they did, but for standing idly by and not proclaiming what thus saith the Lord. That's the problem here with Eli. God is not saying your sons would not have been sinful had you done something. God is saying, your sons are guilty, and oh, by the way, God deals with them. Amen? But you're guilty. Because just like they are not walking in obedience to me, you did not walk in obedience to me in the way that you responded to the sinfulness of your children. It is not enough to simply say, oh, well, that's the way they are. So what do we do here? Here's what we're going for in that first phase. It's really simple. Verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So, in that first phase, we want our children to learn to do what they're told. It's really simple. If I tell my child to do something and they don't do what I told them, they did not obey. If they did not obey, that's altogether disobedience. Secondly, I want my children to learn to do what they're told when they're told. 
If I tell my child to do something and my child doesn't do what I told my child to do when I told my child to do it, but instead waits until they feel like doing it, that's delayed obedience. And there is a very important Greek word for delayed obedience. It is disobedience. Our children must learn to do what they're told when they're told and to do it with a respectful attitude. Honor your father and your mother. It's the first command with a promise. Honor your father and your mother. So if I tell my child to do something, and my child does what I tell them and when I tell them, but does it with the wagging of the head and the clucking of the tongue and the stomping of the feet and the slamming of the door, etc., 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 they have still violated the fifth commandment. That's wrong. It's unacceptable. And it has to be corrected. That's what we're shooting for in these first three years. We've got so many people out there, and there's programs out there. They will tell you, buy this, and your child will learn to read by age three. You know what? Much more important that your child learn to do what they're told, when they're told, with a respectful attitude. Much more important. You can learn to read whenever. Okay? I know there are all these people out there, the earlier they learn how to read, the better off they're going to be. There's plenty of people who learn how to read by age three who hate books today. Plenty of other folks who learn how to read much later in life that just can't put them down. Am I saying that it's not important that we teach our children to read? Please don't. Okay? That is not my point. But what I am saying is if you put reading by age three on one side of the scale and learning to do what you're told when you're told with a respectful attitude on the other, the scales tip in the side of obedience. We must teach our children to obey. Will they do this perfectly? Will they do anything perfectly? No. No. Our children will not do this perfectly. But it is incredibly important that they do this. Why? First, because God commands it. Secondly, because we're going to move to the next phase. We're teaching our children something, and it is nigh unto impossible to teach a disobedient child. And we want our children to give us their hearts. And so we work toward disobedience. Not to impress people. We work toward this because we have a greater goal in mind. We represent God's authority in their lives. And we want them to understand the importance of obedience. And so it's important that we communicate that to them during this phase. What do we avoid? Avoid inconsistency. Avoid inconsistency. What does inconsistency look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. Inconsistency looks like mom has one standard of obedience and dad has another, and instead of getting on the same page, they send mixed messages to the child. That's inconsistency. Or how about the inconsistency of when we're at home, we have one standard, but when we're out in front of people and don't want to be embarrassed, we have another. That is inconsistency. And it confuses the child. So we want to avoid inconsistency. We want to be consistent. Secondly, we want to avoid anger. We want to avoid anger. Why? Well, according to James 1.19, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We want to avoid anger. We want to avoid using anger as a tool against our children. That's wrong. Because I don't want my children to obey me because they fear me. I want them to obey me because they honor me and the position that God has placed me in. So we avoid anger. Things like yelling. But you need to confess, I used to be a yeller. I was a yeller. I just, I was. It was just my thing. I yelled. My lovely wife one day. Pulled me aside and she said, sweetheart, I love you. I just need to say something to you. You are a very large, scary, deep, dark milk chocolate man with a scary voice. You don't have to yell at anybody. (laughs) Here's the other thing I had to learn. As a big, scary man with a big, scary voice who yelled at his children, I was teaching them to respond in fear to me. My wife's not big and scary. They didn't respect her the same way. 
That's what anger and yelling and all that stuff gets. We want to win our children's hearts. Anger doesn't do that. And the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If we are using anger as a tool, we are not trusting God. We're not trusting God. Avoid contradiction. Contradiction like what? Contradiction like, you be kind to your brother. Can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Okay? That's contradiction. How about this contradiction? Johnny, put down that toy. One. Two. Three. See, wait a minute, that's contradiction? Yeah, that's contradiction. Because remember what I said earlier? There's a Greek word for delayed obedience, and it is called disobedience. If I tell Johnny to do something, and then I count, I'm teaching Johnny, you don't have to do what I say when I say it, but somewhere between when I say it and when I count to three. In other words, here's what I'm doing. I'm saying, Johnny, Daddy wants to teach you something. Daddy wants to teach you this thing called delayed obedience. Or, Johnny, let Daddy just be honest. Daddy wants to teach you to sin. So, Johnny, put that down. One. I'm coaching Johnny in sin. I'm flexing his sin muscle. And I'm teaching him delayed obedience by counting or by repeating myself 97 times. I didn't say never repeat yourself. Sometimes Johnny might not have heard me. By the way, there's a way to figure that out. You tell Johnny to do something. Johnny doesn't do it. You start walking toward Johnny with the rod of correction. Johnny will either, one, immediately go and do what he heard you say, in which case he's busted, or Johnny will say, what did I do? Then Johnny earns a repeat. (laughs) What to employ? You know what? Employ encouragement with your children. There is this beautiful grace that God gives our children. And it is this desire that they have to please us. That thing in them that lights up when you put something on the refrigerator that they did, or that thing in them that smiles so big that you, it looks like they're going to break their face just because you said, Yay! There's something. In, that's, that's God's grace. That's God's grace. Use that. Not use that. But enjoy that. It's God's grace. Encourage your children. Secondly, instruct your children. Instruct your children. This is formative discipline. Instruct your children. Imagine if you will. You know, there's a, a coach who comes out, and you know, you got a basketball team, and the coach comes out, and he's got his players out there. It's the first day of practice. And he throws the ball out there, and he says, Okay, guys, I want you guys to run our full court press. Guys, let's go. What's wrong? I can't imagine. Come on. Everybody's doing laps. What's the problem? Oh, Coach, it's the first day of practice. You never taught us what our full court press was. And you're now punishing us for not doing something that you never taught us to do. By the way, don't get too hard on the coach. Because the overwhelming majority of Christian parents who say, Johnny, share have never taken 15 minutes to teach Johnny how to share. They've never sat down with Johnny and Susie and Mikey and said, okay, Johnny, Susie, and Mikey, we're going to play the sharing game. What's the sharing game? We're going to learn how to share. Daddy's going to have the toy, and you're going to look, and Daddy's going to have the toy, and we rejoice with one another because we are members of one another. You rejoice when I rejoice. So you're happy because I have the toy. But now I also want to rejoice when you rejoice, so I'm going to give it to Susie. And Susie's going to have her turn. And we're going to delight in the fact that Susie's enjoying this because this is called sharing. Remember? Because we're members of one another. I rejoice when you... Notice there's biblical principles being taught here, and I'm actually showing them exactly what I want them to do. You'd be surprised how many Christian parents have never once instructed their children in anything. 
never once sat down and taken 5, 10, 15 minutes with their children to teach them to do those things that we expect them to do. Never once said, okay, we're going to practice greeting. When we greet, what do we do? When we greet, we stand up, we look in the eye, we reach our hand, we shake firmly, none of the fish, you know what I mean? Come on, that's how we do it. And we do it, and it's great. What do we do? Encouragement, that's awesome, that's wonderful, that's great. Let's do it again. That's awesome, that's wonderful, that's great. Let's do it again. That's awesome, that's wonderful, that's great. Let's do it again. And all of a sudden, the shy kid who likes to hide behind your leg when he meets other people comes to church the next day and looks at you and says, Can we do it? Here comes somebody. And they may just get it backwards because they're thinking about it so hard. Okay, I'm going to shake and I'm going to pray. I'm going to go, oh, I'm going to look at, you know. And you can see them going through the motions. But what are they doing? They're recalling what you taught them. And they're attempting to comply. Now, once you've encouraged your children and instructed your children, they are going to rebel against what you've instructed and encouraged them to do. So then what do you employ? Correction. Correction. For those who are not used to that kind of archaic language, let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Please spank your children early and often. I've met people who've said, you know, I'll tell you what, that one right there, it's just a breeze raising him. Or was it, no, never a him. I never get that with a him. Always with a her. It was just a breeze raising her. I think maybe I spanked her once or twice. <laughs> I'm going, really? That doesn't get us out of the bed in the morning some days. Are you serious? In their whole life? That's not very active parenting. We're not raising Jesus. Amen? Amen. We're raising rebellious children. But some will tell you, I love this, this again is from Wesley. Some will tell you, all this is lost labor. A child need not be spanked at all. Instruction, persuasion, and advice will be sufficient for any child without spanking, especially if gentle reproof be added, as occasion may require. I answer, there may be particular instances wherein this method may be successful, but you must not in any wise lay this down as a universal rule, unless you suppose yourself wiser than Solomon, or to speak more properly, wiser than God. For it is God himself who best knoweth his own creatures, that has told us expressly, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And upon this is grounded that plain commandment directed to all that fear God. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Spank your children. Amen. And we don't like this. Here's why we don't like this. There's a number of reasons we don't like this. Number one reason we don't like this is because we mistakenly believe that our children will love us more if we don't spank them. That's just not true. You don't spank your children, they will grow to despise you. They will not grow to respect you. It is simply not true. Here's the other thing. We believe Dr. Spock and Dr. Phil and Dr. Oprah more than we believe Dr. Solomon. Amen. Because Dr. Solomon says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, folly is bound up in the heart of the child, and the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Imagine, if you will, your child is bitten by a snake. We talk about this around Texas. We got gang- Every, you know, Everybody knows what to do, especially out, out in West Texas. You just pull a random person over in West Texas and ask them. They know what to do. What do you do if you're bitten by a snake? Well, first thing you do is you find a snake and you cut his head off. You take the back end and the bitten person, take them to the hospital. You want them both. Why? Because you want the people at the hospital to know what kind of snake bit your baby. So you go, here's my baby. That's what bit him. Then they will come back with the antivenom. 
And then he come back with the antivenom, and they will bring the needle, and they will give the child the shot. The antivenom. Oh, wait a minute! No, 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 no! Don't give my child that shot. Why? Because that needle will hurt my baby. Okay, but there's venom in your child. And I have to give your child this shot so your child will live. Yes, but I love my child, and I do not want you to inflict pain on my child by sticking that needle in my child. So I simply cannot let you do it. Now, no parent would ever do that. Yes, they would. Because God says there's a venom in your child. And the anti-venom is the rod of correction. And your response, oh, but I love my child so much, I could never do that. It's poison. It's poison. Please correct your children. The other reason that we don't like this is because of all the talk of abuse. Are there people who are abused? Yes, there are people who are abused. Yes, Absolutely, there are people who are abused. So don't abuse your children. But spank them. Yes, but, you know, all these people who are abused and spanking and abuse and this and that, there are people who abuse the Internet. You got that? There are people who abuse work. They're called workaholics. Got a job? There are people who abuse all manner of things. That doesn't mean that you abandon those things because somebody abuses them. Employ this, please. By the way, you know what I found? People who abuse children usually are people who don't spank enough. Now, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but let me play this out for you. Mom's home, and Mom's got Johnny and Susie, and Mom's doing her thing, and she's going about her business, and Johnny's just particularly just rowdy today. And Johnny gets up in the morning, and Johnny's playing around and doing whatever and not being very obedient. Mom's frustration meter grows up a little bit, goes up to about a one, but it's okay. Johnny's all right. Eventually, she gets him wrangled, gets her clothes on, come down to the table. Now at the table, he's not being obedient, doesn't want this, he doesn't want that. He throws a tantrum, so on and so forth. Mommy's frustration meter goes up a little bit more, but that's okay. We get through breakfast. After that, Johnny's supposed to sit down and do whatever. Johnny doesn't want to be obedient. Johnny wants to do what Johnny wants to do. Eventually, Mom just sort of gives in. That frustration meter is going up higher and higher and higher. Nap time comes. Johnny doesn't want to take a nap. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Mom's frustration meter is off the charts. Now Susie decides that she wants to join in. Mom's frustration meter is off the charts now. They finally get up. It's time for them to do something after lunchtime. Johnny does one more thing, and Mom goes off. And she wails on the boy in anger and abuses the child. All because she refused to give him the 10 or 12 spankings that he should have gotten earlier in the day. Where she was under control. Where she could have brought the scripture to bear. Showed him his sin. Reminded him of the God who loves him and therefore gave him parents who would correct him. Reminded him that Christ had to die because of sins like the one that he committed, and that ultimately he needs Jesus for forgiveness. She should have done that 10, 11, 12 times, lovingly and under control, but she didn't. So she got angry, and she beat the child. Now, he's confused, she feels guilty, and guess what? It'll be that much longer before she spanks him again. And when she does, you guessed it. She'll probably uh, probably be out of control. That's what happens with the abuse. Active parenting, spanking our children on a regular basis, it becomes tiring. Some of them will go through phases where you've got a few days where you feel like they, one of y'all is not going to make it. <laughs> Amen. And there will be those moments. We have those moments. We call them tag team moments. Okay? We call them tag team moments. And Mama will come in and she will say, will you please go spank your son? And I have to go, okay, which one? Because, <laughs> you know. And why? why? Why do I need to go spank your son? Because I love him and I want him to live. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> 
Son, Daddy's here to spank you because Mom loves you and wants you to live. And if she did this, I understand, Dad. Do those moments come? Yes, those moments come. But here's what's interesting. The more committed we are to dealing with things regularly, the less likely we are to get to those kinds of moments. And so we employ correction, loving correction. By the way, in our home, correction of our children always ends with reconciliation. Always ends with reconciliation. It never ends with additional punishment, especially the kind of punishment that says, I'm so mad at you, I just don't want to see your face. Well, wait a minute. I sinned. Justice was swift and it's been meted out. Now you're going to punish me with the relationship too? Sounds like you're holding on to something that you should have let go of. Again, if you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. That's a you problem. Now you need to go deal with God. Deal with your child. Reconcile with your child. And then move on. So that your child recognizes that what he is hitting his head against is a rock called God's truth and God's word. Not This is not about my relationship with you. I love you. And it's because I love you that I'm obeying God in this area. It's not personal. I'm doing this because it's my duty as your parent and because I want the best for you. And once it's over, it's over. We need to reconcile and we just move on. Well, what happens if I spank my child and my child won't reconcile? I'm afraid you have to spank them again. Because that's rebellion. Well, what if I do that and I just get tired? Tag team. Some of you are looking at me like you know what I'm talking about. Because you had a session or two like that. It happens. It happens. But our children need to know that we're absolutely committed to them. And we're absolutely committed even more to God and what He says about the way we deal with them. They need to know that. Why is it important? Eventually we get to this next level. We even deal with it. We start it even when they're smaller and they can't quite understand it. But eventually we formally get to the catechism phase. In the catechism phase, we say to our child, give me your mind. In the first phase, it's give me your attention. In this next phase, it's give me your mind. Now that I have your attention, hear me. There's some things that I want to teach you. Again, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That means we are to teach them what to believe and why to believe it. This happens when our children become verbal. You know one of the greatest tragedies in recent days is this emphasis. You, you see, uh, young people are going off in droves from their churches to universities, and, and they're not lasting. And so a lot of people think that the problem is universities. Or they think the problem is that the kids aren't quite ready and prepared to defend their faith when they get to universities. So what's happening is there's a new trend. And the new trend is you do intensive worldview and apologetics training with your children, you know, 17, 18 years old, so that when they go off to college, they've had a couple of weeks of intensive apologetics training so that everything's okay. So you teach them what to believe and why to believe right before you send them off to slaughter. You teach them what to believe and why to believe when they become verbal. But we're not catechizing anymore. Here's the great irony. What's apologetics? Apologetics, again, based on 1 Peter chapter 3, Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and with reverence. It is knowing what you believe, why you believe it, and being able to communicate that effectively to others. That's, that's the definition of apologetics in a nutshell. Know what you believe, know why you believe it, and be able to communicate that effectively to others. So when people ask you the reason for the hope that is in you, you can respond and give the reason for the hope that is in you. 
So they ask you a question about what you believe, and you can answer the question that they ask about what you believe. Some of you are going, okay, we get it. Why do you keep pressing that point? What's catechism? Catechism is learning what you believe through a series of questions and answers. Apologetics, being able to answer questions about what you believe. Apologetics training is not what you do for two weeks with a 17-year-old before you send them off to the university. It's what you do with two and three-year-olds for the whole time that you got them. Teach them what to believe and why to believe it. What do we employ? Scripture memory. Scripture memory. Our children need to memorize the scriptures. Get it in there. They need to memorize God's word. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you believe that? If you believe that, you'll get the scripture into your child. Secondly, great hymns of the faith. Great hymns of the faith. Why are they great hymns of the faith? They're great hymns of the faith because of their content. They stood the test of the time, test of time because of their content. Teach your children the great hymns of the faith. Get it in there. Cram it in there. CDs, music around your house. Play it. They'll learn it. You'll be amazed. And a catechism that fits your faith tradition. Okay? Do these things. Get it in there. Now, here are some objections that I hear when I talk to people about these things. And again, I know this is part of the culture around here. But you know that there are these objections. Well, you know, I don't want to cram religion down my child's throat. I'd rather them develop a relationship with God, not just that sort of rote memorization religion stuff. (laughs) Really? Do you want them to love books? Of course I do, but you make them learn the ABCs by rote memorization. Do you want them to love education? Of course I do, but you force them to start school before they even know what school is. And you force them to go every day whether they feel like it or not. How come when it comes to God, we're afraid, but when it comes to everything else, we will not compromise? Why is that? No, get it in there. They learn far more than we think they learn. Little Micah, Micah's our our 16-month-old, and this is several months ago. We were at our family worship one evening, and in our our family worship time in the evening, we we end all the time with with the doxology. It's just what we do. And the, boy, the little boys all get excited about that. They love to sing the doxology, and they love to stand up and just belt it out. One day, we're sitting, and our family worship was, was going a little bit longer, and then a little bit longer, a little bit longer. The, the older kids had just sort of latched onto something, and it was just good, you know. Well, it was a little past Micah's bedtime. Micah can't talk, but Micah wanted to communicate to us that he was done. So all of a sudden we hear, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> "What's that?" It's Micah singing the doxology. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> Have we taught him the doxology? Well, yes and no. He heard it every night, and he knew that that's what we did when we finished. They learn more than we think they learn. Last phase. The discipleship phase. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. This is what we're moving toward. This is where we get to the paideia. Where we walk together. Teach them to live out what they've come to believe. And teach them through life on life interaction. Again, this is where we're getting to. So, so many parents will either err on one side or the other. So many parents will work hard on the discipline and training phase because we want obedient children and we value that above all else. And we end up with children who are obedient outwardly and very impressive outwardly. Then there are others who are on the other side. I want knowledgeable children I, I want you, you well-informed children. And we don't deal with the discipline side of the equation. All of these things work together. 
So when we're disciplining our children and training our children, when we're catechizing our children, when we eventually get to this place where we're walking with our children in their adult lives, teaching them to walk out the things that they've learned. By the way, when I say their adult lives, I mean New Testament adulthood, not modern American adulthood. I mean 12, 13 adulthood, not 18 to 35, somewhere in the middle of there, depending on whether you go to graduate school or not, adulthood, okay? I mean biblical adulthood. This time when they reach that age in their life, 12, 13 years old, where you begin to treat them like young adults, and you say to them, give me your hand. You've given me your attention. And as an obedient child, you've learned from me. And I've taught you what to believe and why to believe it. Now, I want you to walk with me as I show you through life-on-life interaction how to walk out these things. This is when we maximize our time together. What do we avoid? Avoid shipping your kids off during this crucial time. You know, one of the things that I just cannot comprehend, I just I don't get it, and I see it everywhere I go. You, know, you see homeschool families who will say, we're going to homeschool until junior high or high school. I'm going, time out! That's the most crucial phase. That's the give me your hand phase. That's the walk with me while I show you how to live out what I've taught you to believe phase. Why? Do you know the most common answer? Sports. That's the answer. I want them in cheerleading. I want them in football. I want them in basketball. Whatever. That is the most common answer. Because we believe that that is the crucial, life-altering experience that all of our children need to have. No. Don't ship your kids off during this time. Secondly, avoid discipleship by proxy. Avoid discipleship by proxy. What is discipleship by proxy? Well, the most common form of discipleship by proxy among Christians in our culture is youth ministry. Amen. Amen. Where the youth pastor is the one who disciples kids. Youth pastors talk about teenagers as my kids, my students. My teenagers, they set the tone, they set the direction, they set the scope and the sequence for what these kids are going to experience while they're in that ministry. And then they have parents who come to them and sit down in the office of this youth pastor, who in most instances have never raised any kids, and say to them, here's the problem that the kid's dealing with, what are you going to do? It's discipleship by proxy. Thirdly, avoid gender confusion. Avoid gender confusion. This is when it's important for young men to be with men and young women to be with women. I, I, and I say this, I say this, I say this. Just hear me on this. I say this so many of the places that I go. One of the, and I'm, I've been so pleased since I've been here. It's been just amazing. But you are going to recognize what I'm talking about immediately. I go to the homeschool conference, and I haven't been doing the homeschool conference thing all that long. I, I really haven't. In that, in the last four or five years, maybe I've been doing homeschool conferences. But I began to notice something, and I've started to talk about it. It makes some people uncomfortable. I have noticed that there is an epidemic of effeminate boys in the homeschool movement. An epidemic of effeminate boys. Boys whose fathers see their role as a homeschool dad as buying the curriculum every year. Every year, Boys who are being discipled by their mothers who would make somebody a great wife one day. But there's nothing masculine about them. It's just wrong. Boys need their fathers. Boys need men. Moms, hear me on this, because sometimes what happens is dad recognizes the need for this boy to be turned into a man, and he sort of steps it up 
with intensity and you respond by putting yourself between the boy and his father because you just don't want him to be that hard on him. Let him go. You let him go. Because there's things about being a man that you just don't understand. He needs to be hard on him. And you sit there, and dad's telling him, suck it up, son. Suck it up, don't you cry. But do I believe it's wrong for a man to cry? I've been crying all weekend. <laughs> but there are times when you don't. And there are times when a father says to his son, suck it up, son, don't you cry. Man up. Butch up, Sally. And mom wants to rescue him and say, oh, he's just a boy, to which dad responds, that's right, he's just a boy. But one day he'll be a man, and he'll be the head of a household, and tragedy's going to strike, and everybody's going to look to him. And if he crumbles, his whole family's going to crumble. And now's when he learns that. And from me is where he learns that. Let him learn it. Let him learn it. Let me harden the boy. Please let me do it. Because we need men. And this is the way you make men. I had a lost mother who got this. One of the blessings of my life was when I was a boy. Again, my mother's single, teenage, Buddhist mother. She doesn't know God. She's living her life, raising a son all by herself. She got pregnant with me when she was 17 years old. So here I am. I get old enough to find a little trouble. In drug-infested, gang-infested South Central L.A., there's enough trouble to be found. My mother did not know what to do with me. And then she figured out something. So we got on a Greyhound bus for three days and went from Los Angeles, California to Beaufort, South Carolina, where I then spent the next year and a half with my uncle, who was a retired drill instructor in the Marine Corps. (laughs) And... um, (laughs) And I got out of trouble. (laughs) Quick, fast, and in a hurry. I lived with a man for the first time in my life. And it was magnificent. He pushed me. He taught me. When I say that, I tell that story and people always have this picture, you know, of the D.I. with his hat on yelling in my face. My uncle never raised his voice at me. He didn't have to. He was every bit the man. He's the kind of man, when he walks into a room, space reorganizes itself around him. (laughs) He's that guy. And it was a magnificent thing. And there were moments where I just came to the end of myself and I just didn't like it. I didn't like it. Christmas time comes, and you buy me this wonderful Christmas gift that I just love because I came from the city. Now I'm out here in the country. I'm out here in this We live in a double-wide trailer. We're out here in these woods, and there's stuff to shoot, and you buy me this pellet rifle. Wasn't a pellet gun. It was a pellet rifle. A daisy, pneumatic, single-pump, BB-slash pellet rifle, okay? It was a rifle. It wasn't a gun. It was a rifle, all right? That was okay. I figured out that it was a rifle. It wasn't a gun. That's cool. I get that. So I'm ready Christmas Day to go out and shoot my rifle. But I don't get my rifle. I get a list before you can have your rifle. You must learn to disassemble and reassemble your weapon, to clean, carry, and control your weapon, to qualify in the backyard on the target range of my design from the three firing positions. I ain't want that old gun anyway. <laughs> I thought he was the meanest man in the world until I got my rifle and nobody could shoot like me. My mama couldn't teach me that. My mother would get upset those days when I would come home and I would be so dirty that she'd have to hose me off in the backyard before I could come into the house. It made her so upset that I ruined so many clothes. But it was all right, because she saw a boy becoming 
a man. But listen to me, folks. This was a lost woman and her lost brother. And they got that. And what I'm saying is there are Christian people out there who are missing this point. There are men out there in the making who need to be made men. There are women out there in the making who need to be made women. And hats off. Hats off to this community because when it comes to making women, we far exceed anything else that's out there. But I just have to say, on the men's side, in many instances, we're falling down. And the reason we're falling down is because of dads, again, who think the extent of their responsibility is buying the curriculum and saying it's okay to homeschool another year. Not because we're committed to it, but because it works for us for now. And there is no vision. Is this easy? It is absolutely not easy. But it's what we're called to. See, the discipline, catechism, and discipleship of our children is not just about outward obedience. We're after our children's hearts. We want our children's hearts. We want them to be pliable. We want them to be soft. We want them to be teachable. We want to communicate their need for Christ again and again and again. We want them to show them their sin And their need for a Redeemer again and again and again. We want to show them justice and mercy again and again and again. And we want to instruct them. We want to fill them up with the Word of God and the great truths of the faith. And then eventually grab them by the hand and walk with them. I told you I don't share a lot of personal anecdotes. I share that one about my life with my uncle. um, Because that's really not about me. And that was just that was just God's grace to me. It really was how God could use my lost mother, who was practicing Buddhism. By the way, yes, my mother is saved. Six months after me, she was converted. And my lost uncle, is he there yet? No, he's not. But he's still in Buford. I know where he is. And so I share that with you. But I share this with you, and hopefully you'll understand why. And one of the reasons I don't share a lot of the personal anecdotes is because it's not about me and my story. It's about Christ and his story. But secondly, the last thing you want when you talk about family, there are a lot of people out there who haven't seen it done. You don't know what to do. So what do you do? You find people out there who are talking about it and teaching it and try to do everything that they do. Well, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Well, I'll do what the Bacchums do for their children. Only problem is we don't do the same thing for every child. Because every child's different. Amen? Amen? There are some of our children. There are some of our children who can get this. There's others. Why bother? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, do you not? There, I mean, there, is, there, is, there are, okay? So we treat our children differently. But I have to tell you this. Um, several years ago, Trey and I, my, my oldest son Trey and I, started traveling together, and um, we're, we're weary now because we just came back from the Middle East together. We've been traveling together for four years now, four years, and I'll never forget one trip in particular when we went to a church in a state that shall remain nameless, um, really close to here, and here we are in this nameless state, really close to here. And I'm I'm doing this event, and I finish this event, and I'm just I'm tired, I'm I'm beat, I'm worn out, and I've talked to a number of people, and after we talked to a number of people, I'm outside and I'm in the parking lot, and while I'm outside in the parking lot, this one young man comes up to me. He is a youth pastor, and no, I'm sorry, he's a college minister, and he has several of his other college students around with him. And I talked about some of these things, and he knows some about some of the stuff that I've written and said about youth ministry, college ministry, so on and so forth. And so he's got a few questions for me while his little cronies stand around. And he's trying to show off because he's got like, you know, a week's worth of 
theological training. And so here he is, and he wants to ask me these questions. And he wants to ask me these questions. And while he's asking me these questions, he's asking me these questions. Now, I'm standing over here facing him. He's facing He's not even facing me. I, I just, I want, you know, he's pontificating in front of his friends. Trying to show off in front of his friends. Well, my son is right here. I'm tired. But I, I stand there, and he says a little piece, and I answer his question. I answer his question. He doesn't like my answer. doesn't know what to do with it, so he goes to another subject. He goes to another subject. I answer that question. It's getting worse for him. And his boys are starting to kind of look down like, you know what, this ain't going well for you. Because you're wrong. And he keeps going. And eventually, after a while, it must have gone on for 20, 25 minutes. Parking lot's emptying out. And I said, you know what? I keep answering your questions. And you keep going on to other things. You're really not interested in my answers. And I'm really tired. So he gets an attitude. So I said, listen, you have been completely and utterly disrespectful to me. I have tried to be patient and kind, but I'm done. And he looks at me and he says, how come you people always got to turn it into a respect issue? At which time his friends simultaneously take a step back. (laughs) And I looked at him and I said, "I I hope. When you say you people, you mean tall people. (laughs) I gave him an out, and he didn't take it. And he said, no, why is it that colored people always talk about... I said, really? Colored people? Like, for real? Colored people? I said, you know what? I'm going to leave now. He wouldn't move. And his fr- at this point, his friends are kind of going, "Hey, man, come on, let's, you know, let's, you know." And he he keeps going at it. And finally, firmly, I look at him and I say, "This conversation is over. You're leaving now, and I'm leaving now." At which point, his boys grab him and they take him off. The organizers of the event are out there, and he goes, "Dude, dude, I'm so sorry. I just, man, I'm sorry. I can't believe it. Listen, that's okay. I'll be see y'all in the morning. Blah, whatever." My son, who's probably 14, 15 at the time, is with me, witnesses all this. We ride back to the hotel, and there's just silence. We get back to the hotel room, and there's silence. We lay down in our beds, and there's silence. And then Trey goes, Dad, yes, son, did that guy realize that you could crush him? I said probably son dad did you want to crush it oh like you wouldn't believe son silence again dad I'm proud of you I remember thinking to myself He can't get this from a book. And lest I became puffed up the next day at the airport, they messed up our reservation. And I was unkind. Now we're getting ready to go through security, and this same boy doesn't even want to give me eye contact. And I said, come on, son. We go back to the desk. And I say, ma'am, I know you didn't mess up my reservation. I know you didn't do it on purpose. I know that wasn't your fault. And even if you had, I should never have spoken to you the way that I did. Would you please forgive me? She started to cry. And I remember thinking again. When I was up here, my boy couldn't have learned that from a book. Now I'm down here. My boy couldn't learn that from a book. At my best, at my worst. It's discipleship. It's walking together. Here's how you get it right, son. But lest you think too much of that, more often than not, here's where you're going to be. 
We are a repentant people, not just to become Christians. But as Christians, we are a repentant people. What's that about? It's about give me your hand. Let's walk together. And let's see what it looks like when you put feet to all this stuff that you've learned to believe. See, if our only goal is that our kids are obedient so that they look good to the outside world, we don't get that. Why do we want obedient children? My son, give me your heart. and Let your eyes observe my ways. The obedience is the give me your heart part. But eventually we move to the let your eyes observe my ways. Do what I say. Do what I say. And eventually, when you understand a little better, we'll walk together. And you do what I do. And many days it'll be, but not that. Amen? But it's all discipleship. That's what we're doing as we raise this next generation. Unfortunately, for the most part, when you talk about child training and discipline, most people, their vision is this. How do I get my little ones to obey? Is that important? Yes, it is. But only in the context this. How do we live a life together with our children and raise disciples to the glory and honor of Christ? Is that a part of it? Yes, it is. But please, don't let it become the sum total. Because you miss the biggest part of the picture. Let's pray.